want to welcome you to our YouTube channel, Escaping the Revolving Door. I'm John LaMaster. You're viewing the fifth video session now, the 12 session video course entitled Escaping the Revolving Door of Prison. Be sure to view video sessions one through four if you haven't done so already uh, so that you can get a better understanding of our full course content and why this course of study is so different from other courses that you may have taken to help with your rehabilitation. Make sure you hit the subscribe button below if you would and give us a thumbs up if you find this video helpful. In our last session, class number four, we covered part two of making better choices and decisions by going through a series of five questions you could ask yourself before you make important choices to help eliminate 75% or more of poorly made choices. Next, we looked at co uh, 10 common mistakes that people tend to make and to help you avoid making those same mistakes and then we investigated various ways that businesses uh, could avoid making bad decisions and choices. In this class, we want to cover the third of the seven major contributors uh, to reoffending that the men in our class at, at a correctional facility where my wife Kathleen and I were uh, teaching a Bible study came up with as reasons for reoffending. They said that after they were released from prison, they either started to engage in substance abuse or they reestablished their old habit that led them down the wrong road by causing them to waste their resources, their, their time, their, their energy, and their, of course their money, and kept them from doing their best on their jobs and other activities. In addition, uh, their addiction to drugs caused a lot of pain and suffering in their families. The goal and purpose in covering this subject is to offer you some helps and insights on how to triumph and be victorious over addictions of any kind. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus tells us the thief, the tormentor, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And the most powerful tools that Satan has and uses to accomplish this are addiction and discouragement. When you purchase illicit drugs uh, from a supplier, it's like he or she is putting a gun to your ribs and robbing you of your money and your life. He or she is a messenger of Satan to help Satan accomplish his ultimate goal of destroying your life. Before we get into the heart of our study on overcoming drug abuse, I'd like to share with you a little human interest story. There was a small boy in his sandbox playing one day and digging around in the sand, and, and finally he dug around and, and struck a rock as he dug deeper. He kept on digging and found it to be a giant rock that, that he could just barely move. He struggled and fought to dislodge the rock from the sand so he could remove it from his sandbox. With one final effort, he, he used all the strength he could muster up uh, to remove it, and all he did was roll back and smash his fingers. So he just sat there, and he began to cry. His dad, hearing the commotion, ran over to find out what was happening. Uh, and the father said, what, what's going on, son? As he looked up through, through his tear-filled eyes, the boy explained to his dad that he'd used everything that he could think of to try to get that rock out. But he had just plain failed. His dad simply said, uh, you didn't use everything available to your son. You didn't ask me to help you. Like that little boy, every one of us has giant obstacles of some sort that hamper us from being successful, keep us defeated, or keep us trapped in unhealthy relationships and behaviors. So we need God the Father's help too, don't we? Someone has said challenges make life interesting, and overcoming them is what makes life meaningful. In this class number five video, I want us to look at how we can face and defeat the giant of addiction in our lives by 
First looking at a familiar biblical historical account of David and Goliath. You may be familiar with this Bible story. Many people are. The normal reaction to giants in our lives is what? To get discouraged and to give up and despair. I think we can gain hope and much from learning to utilize the five truths that empowered this, this man David to approach the giant Goliath and defeat him on the battlefield. We'll also cover a session on why taking drugs gives this pleasurable feeling uh, many refer to as a high by discussing a little bit about brain chemistry and the release of the neurotransmitter dopamine when we receive a reward that gives us a sense of pleasure. Uh, then we will discuss 10 ways that you can increase that dopamine level in your brain naturally, thereby inducing a sense of pleasure, uh, but it'll be both legal, uh, legal and healthier, and it won't lead to an addiction. And then finally, we'll go into a lot of detail on overcoming drug abuse and addiction with a seven-step practical guide to overcoming drug addiction. You know, the American public is captivated by upsets in sports. 3,000 years ago, a young man by the name of David stepped into the Valley of Elah, which is a long, shallow valley located in Israel on the West Bank, and in one incredible moment, achieved the greatest upset in history. His story is recorded in 1 Samuel 17. The story begins as the armies of Israel and Philistia gather their forces for war and face each other across this valley of Elah located west of Jerusalem and, and Bethlehem. The battle line is drawn. The Phil Philistines uh, occupy one hill to the north and the Israelites uh, a hill to the south with that valley between them. Uh, here's a photo courtesy of holylandphotos.org showing the location that I'm describing right now. Uh, both armies are at a standstill. Neither side wants to advance because the cliffs of the hills they occupy uh, protect their positions. Uh, in verse number 4, uh, the Bible tells us that a champion of the Philistines by the name of Goliath from Goth. Uh, Goth was one of the five city-states of, of the Philistines. He came out from their camp and began to shout words of defiance and, and taunted the Israelites. And in situations like this, an, an army often avoided bloodshed by, by choosing their best warrior to go head-to-head -head against the other army's best warrior. Uh, whichever side won, uh, the losing side would either retreat or surrender and Verse 8 and 9, uh, Goliath says, choose a man to fight me. If he kills me, then we'll be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. This Philistian uh, war warrior was no ordinary man. The Bible goes at great length to describe him and show how formidable a foe he was. From his outward appearance, he appeared to be invincible. He is nine feet, six inches tall. The average Hebrew of this time was only five foot six. Uh, he wears a bronze helmet, a, a leg armor, and bronze uh, shin guards. Bronze, as you know, is an alloy of copper and tin and produces an alloy that's much harder than just plain copper. His bron bronze armor uh, weighs just a little bit over 150 pounds. Uh, to put this in perspective, this was more than the average Hebrew even weighed. Uh, his spear had an iron point on it that weighed over 15 pounds. Now, you may know this, but the Olympic shot put weighs 15.94 pounds. Uh, the world record for the shot put is a little over 75 feet. Goliath could throw his 15-pound iron-pointed spear much further than that. For 40 days, Goliath came forward every morning and evening and repeated his defiance. The whole Israeli army was terrified, and not one man among them volunteered to fight Goliath. 
In verse 32, David, who had come to the battle line to only visit his brothers, says to King Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go out and fight him. Saul was the leader of the Israelite army and was chosen for that position because the Bible said he was over six feet tall, much taller than any other of the Israelites. And it was thought he would be able to defeat Goliath. But Saul refused to go out against the giant in battle. Then Saul replied to David, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're, you're only a boy, and he, he's been a fighting man from his youth. Members of the army of Israel uh, had to be at least 20 years old, so we, we know David wasn't, uh, wasn't in the army, so he had to be younger than that. Many believe he was, he was only 15 years old, and some believe he's as young as 12. Then the Bible says that David went to the stream and chose five smooth stones and put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag. And with his sling in his hand, he ran to meet Goliath on that battlefield. In verse 42, when Goliath sees David come to fight him and saw that he was no more than a boy, he said, am I a dog that you come at me with, with a stick, with sticks? But in verse 45, David replies, you come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. Then in verse 49, David reaches into the bag containing the, the five stones, puts one into the sling, and he hurls it at Goliath. And it strikes Goliath right in the forehead. It sinks deep into his forehead. And Goliath falls face down dead. I want us to take a look at this historical account of David and Goliath. And try to see if there's an application we can make of what those five stones David chose that day might represent for my and your life. But first, let's try to get an understanding of what giants are that we, many of us have to face. First, let's define what a giant is. Well, a giant is something that discourages us and keeps us in bondage and stands in the way of us fulfilling God's purpose for our life. Uh, what are the giants in your life? Let, let, me, let me give you a partial listing. This is not all, but it's just quite a list. Anger, bitterness, depression discouragement, family dysfunction, fear, guilt, and shame, hopelessness, loneliness, jealousy, pride, resentment, unforgiveness, and worry. Uh, just to name a few <laughs> of the giants that we might have to face. Uh, the biggest giants, according to inmates in prison, uh, the people that were in our class, uh, we interviewed, and they said that loneliness, John, of prison life and the family dysfunction that they had to suffer early in their lives when they were growing up were the biggest giants they had to face. As you probably are aware, these giants I've mentioned here are uh, responsible for many of the emotional and health conditions and afflictions uh, people experience. And it's an important for us to to learn how to defeat these giants for our own well-being. But the last giant I want to mention is an addiction to alcohol or drugs. You may have been struggling with it for years and years. You've done everything in your power, like that little boy, to try to break the habit and be free of the desire. The normal reaction to giants in, in our lives is what? To get discouraged and give up in despair, as I mentioned? This is what most drug addicts do. Uh, they find they cannot win against their addiction, uh, so they just find they totally give up. I think we can learn much from David on how we can defeat the giants in our lives. So how did David have the courage, uh, a boy, to go up against this giant of a man? named Goliath. When David climbed down from the hill of the Israelite army where they occupied it, 
into that valley of Elah, the Bible says that he crossed a stream, stooped down, and, and chose those five stones that I just mentioned. Uh, and, but I want us to look at what those, I think, those five stones might represent in battling the giants in our lives. Those five stones, I think, represent five truths that empowered David and gave him the strength to face this giant of a man. First of all, he chose the stone of courage to slay our giants. What do we have to do? We have to face them. Uh, when this imposing figure of a man came down out of the Philistine camp, David didn't run. He, he didn't try to hide, but he faced the giant head on. Somehow, David had developed the confidence and courage to face this formidable fighting man, Goliath. But when we look at the giant problems in our lives, what do we do? We tend to do the same thing that the Israelite army did. We become so overwhelmed uh, by our problem uh, that we tend to run from it or ignore it because we're either afraid of it or we just really don't know what to do about it. Uh, un unfortunately, our problems rarely go, by, or go away by themselves. When we run or ignore them, what happens? Uh, the, the, the tendency is just for them to get bigger and bigger every day, and the problem seems more intimidating than the day before. God's saying to you, this is the time for you to decide to face that giant in your life. It's time for you to be courageous and win the victory. The next stone that David picked up was the stone of faithfulness. I'm calling it the stone of faithfulness. When David confronted, when the giant confronted David, David reviewed his past to see how God had been faithful. He said, God helped me when I was, when I was attacked by a lion. He gave me the victory when a bear attacked me. If God protected me with those animals, surely he will help me now. When struggles come, when hard times approach, we should review the victories we've experienced uh, in our lives, in your life. Review the times God has been faithful to you in the past. You know, realize it or not, uh, there, we, we've all had victories in our lives that we, we can't re really remember. Most of us can recite the failures of our past in, in vivid detail, but we are hard-pressed to name the victories uh, we've experienced. God helped David slay the giant, but what did David have to do? He had to step into the valley. The third stone that, he put, that David chose was the stone of trust. It's not enough to know to, and have faith that God can help us in a situation. The question, question we have to answer and feel confident of is, is God going to come to my aid in, in the time of my need? Uh, God doesn't just snap his fingers to make something happen because we believe he can. Uh, what's it do? It requires an act of faith on our part. Stepping out in faith, believing that it's not just our battle to fight alone. David didn't ask for a sword like a Goliath sword. He simply used what God gave him. Sometimes when we face problems, we say, you know, if I just had something else, I could get through this. If, if, I, if I had better friends, I could get through this. If I had more money, I know I could get through this then. But 2 Peter 1.3 says, His divine grace has given us everything we need for life and godliness. When David went to fight Goliath, he didn't trust his own strength. He didn't trust his own ability. He didn't trust his planning. He ran to meet the giant because he trusted God. Then David chose the stone of preparation. At first glance, it looked like David was totally unprepared for his encounter with Goliath. Remember, he came to the battle wearing his shepherd clothes. Uh, he hadn't anticipated that he'd be going into a battle against the giant, but God had been preparing David for a number of years. Uh, the only David brought uh, with him was his sling and his trust in God to deliver him whatever he had to face. Victories 
have to be first one in the training room and not on the field. You know, I've said this in in previous uh, classes. Don't look at being in prison as punishment. It's going to make you bitter, not better. See it as a time in your in the training room, as a as a time of preparation for your successful reentry into society. Let me tell you a story. Uh, there was a former uh, uh, Michigan State football coach by the name of Duffy Daughtery. He tells a great story about a winning field goal kicked by a young named another David, this one David Kaiser. Uh, the field goal gave Michigan State a 17 to 14 victory over UCLA. As David came back to the bench uh, to meet his roaring enthusiasm of his teammates, uh, the coach said, nice going, David, but I-, I noticed you didn't even watch the ball after you kicked it. How come? And Kaiser replied, you know, I was watching the referee to see how he would call it. Y- you see, I-, I forgot my contact lenses. They're back at the hotel. I couldn't even see the goalpost very clearly. Kaiser, who was a disciplined kicker, had practiced many long hours. He knew well the angle and the distance to the goal, even though he could hardly see it. The whole process of kicking the ball was programmed into his body and mind by the ongoing discipline of daily practice. In that moment when the ball went through the goalposts, discipline and preparation had paid off. In the same way as athletes prepare for competition well in advance of the event, so must you be preparing yourself spiritually before you have to face the giants in your life. Otherwise, you won't be ready to take on that adversary. The time to prepare for your release from prison, my friend, is right now. Then David chose the stone of reward. David asked the question, uh, what does the guy get who who kills a giant? Uh, The answer was, uh, he'll get a boatload of cash. Uh, He gets the princess. But better than that, he and his family are exempted from taxes for the rest of their lives. That's pretty special. David visualized the reward of the victory. To slay our giants, we have to visualize the rewards. What would your life look like if your giant wasn't there to torment you? We know the rest of the story. David, with God's help, slays the giant with just one stone from his sling. A great victory for David and for Israel. You see, when victories come, it's a blessing not only to you, but but to your family, to your friends, and praise for the God who brought you through. You you know, you don't enjoy the victory alone because there's always many that will be sharing that victory along with you. As David defeated the giant, let's take a closer look at how to defeat the giant of addiction that you might have in your life. Uh, What does the Bible say about drug use anyway? Well, some people say that you know, doing drugs is not, I, I know it's not good for me, John, but there, I know of no express prohibitions about drug use in the Bible. So, so what does the Bible say about doing drugs? Well, the Bible doesn't uh, uh, directly address any form of illicit drug use. Uh, there's no express prohibitions against cocaine or heroin or, or meth or marijuana or pre- prescription pain medications like codeine or Oxycontin or Percocet. Those are not even mentioned, are they? Uh, Vicodin, uh, f- uh, f- fentanyl, which is supposed to be 100 times stronger than heroin, and carfentanil, which is 100 times stronger than fentanyl. So five, and 5,000 times as potent as heroin, uh, which is said to be a, a cause of, of lots of overdose deaths, and not only in, in the U.S., but around the world. As you might know, the entertainer Prince uh, overdosed on fentanyl. This is not to say, however, that rec- recreational drug use is, is permissible. Permissible. Uh, On on the contrary, there are several very clear biblical principles that 
place drug use well outside the realm of acceptable behavior. Uh, to begin with, everyone is under a universal mandate to uh, respect the obey the, the laws of the land, according to Matthew twenty two twenty one and and Romans thirteen, to name just a few scriptures. If you, if you think your favorite recreational drug uh, isn't mentioned in the Bible, you're misinformed because what you're doing falls under the heading of pharmakia. You say what? What is that, John? In, in the Greek language. Pharmakia, in the English translation, it's sorcery or witchcraft. The spread of psychedelics, uh, uh, narcotics, and hypnotic drugs fulfills the prophetic scripture as forms of sorcery that would lead the nations into a rejection of Jesus Christ. These, drug, these drugs produce an altered state of consciousness and and sometimes even produce hallucinations or perceptions of things that are really not present. In an altered state of consciousness produced by recreational drug use, a person becomes more susceptible and open to suggestion from others. Uh, that's why some men and women under a drug's influence commit crimes. And some don't even remember that they did it. You know, that's truly scary. Let's go into a little more depth on this Greek word pharmakia and the English translation sorcery and witchcraft. Uh, the mention of pharmakia uh, is listed as one of the acts of the sinful nature uh, mentioned in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Vine's dictionary gives this perspective on pharmakia. Vine says it primarily signifies the use of drugs, spells, and then poisoning. In other words, overdosing on drugs. Overdoses from various drugs have reached epidemic proportions, as you might know. In 2015, more than 33,000 people in the United States died from overdoses. In 2016, it, it more than doubled, 64,000, almost doubled, 64,000 overdosed and 230,000 worldwide. We lost 72,000 people in the U.S. in 2017 and 70,000 in both 2018 and 2019. Now, one American overdoses every 11 minutes. Think about it. The U.S. Surgeon General recently stated that the drug epidemic is a moral test for America. Overdoses have killed over a half million people since the year 2000. You know, I'm going to say something pretty provocative, but... Anyone who suggests to you that you should take drugs to try to get high and get, they, they're, they're trying to get you to accept a death sentence. Uh, why am I saying that? Well, a friend of mine who grew up in the drug to uh, culture told me that more than a hundred of his drug addict friends uh, who, who, whose daily activities uh, revolved around drug use had died of overdoses. If you are aware, of, of, uh, as you probably are aware, of, of so many extremely talented and intelligent people have succumbed to the seductive charm of drug abuse and have, have become addicted. In this class, we want to teach you how to resist becoming addicted in the first place and then what to do, how to break free of an addiction if you're already hooked. Now I want to get us into what I said earlier. Why does drugs give people that pleasurable feeling referred to as a high? Our brains contain a number of chemical substances called neurotransmitters that help our brains to function properly. Uh, when people expect or receive a reward, one of these neurotransmitters, dopamine, is released. That reward might be a delicious slice of pizza or a favorite song. 
this dopamine release tells the brain that whatever it just experienced is worth getting more of. It's part of why humans seek out another slice of pizza, reward and reinforcement. Help us learn where to find important things such as food or water uh, so that we can go back for more. Dopamine even affects our moods. Uh, Things that are rewarded tend to make us feel pretty good. But dopamine has a more sinister side. Drugs such as cocaine, nicotine, heroin, alcohol, and amphetamine and others cause huge boosts in dopamine. Many of these drugs also mimic our natural neurotransmitters uh, because the chemical structure of these drugs is very similar to the natural ones uh, that, and, and so contribute, uh, can contribute uh, to the high people feel uh, when they're taking drugs. And that high prompts people to seek, seek out those drugs again and again, even though they know they're harmful, even though they shouldn't do it. Indeed, the brain reward associated with that high can and often does lead to drug abuse and then eventually to drug addiction. Drugs cause a high because they overstimulate that part of the brain that feels pleasure by as much as ten times what natural rewards do. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that helps control the brain's reward and pleasure center. So we're So are we just helpless against these extreme pleasure-producing chemical substance we call drugs? I want to tell you this, absolutely not. There are a number of ways to cause the reward center of our brains to sense pleasure without the addictive and destructive effects of drugs. I want to go into a partial listing of of ways that you can increase the dopamine levels in your brain naturally, thereby inducing a sense of pleasure that is both legal and healthier and does not lead to addiction. Sure, there are a a lot of different ways that you can increase dopamine levels in the brain, but I've got a a small list here of about 10 that I'd like to kind of go through real quickly. Uh, First of all, number one, seek a lifestyle change that results in more fulfillment or rewards. It's been found that the root cause of addiction is the need to achieve fulfillment, satisfaction, and a sense of feeling unique and important that causes an urge to achieve these needs uh, some way, even through substance abuse. Benjamin Franklin has a a word for us here. He he said an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. It seems obvious, but but not getting addicted to alcohol or drugs in the first place is better than going through the painful exercise of trying to overcome addiction later. As we mentioned earlier, when we receive a reward of any kind, dopamine is released in our brains. Over time, the stimulus of dopamine can lead to learning that's very difficult to unlearn. What this means is that low dopamine is a response to a lifestyle that doesn't offer much in terms of reward to the person, a person living in it. He, it may be a response to the environment you're living in, the clothes you even the clothes you're wearing, the, the tight budget you're working within, or the relationship choices you have made, or the result of trauma. The second one is make a checklist of of tasks and mark them off when completed. Dopamine increases, strangely enough, when we're organized and finish tasks. Regardless if the task is small or large, uh, so so don't allow your brain to worry about things that need to be done. Instead, what do you want to do? Write those tasks down and then check them off one at a time as they're completed. It's been shown that it's more satisfying to the brain's dopamine levels when we physically check off something of our, on our do, to-do list. Uh, even write down and check off stuff regardless if you can mentally remember those tasks uh, anyway. 
I, I do this a lot uh, myself. I, I love the pleasure of completing a task and checking them off. My, my wife laughs at me. She said uh, she knows that sometimes I put something on the list that I've already completed just so I can mark it off. Isn't that funny? Next, take up a hobby or an activity where you can create something. For writers and painters, uh, sculptors, poets, singers, and other artists, they can identify with this thing called creativity. Uh, we're in a creative mode. We can become extremely focused. As a result, we, we can enter a state that they call flow. And dopamine is the brain chemical that allows us to achieve this state. Uh, the lesson's this. Take up a hobby or an activity in which you can actually create something tangible. Try something like arts or crafts, even auto repair, uh, drawing, photography, or, or something else that, that just sounds interesting to you. Stimulating that creative drive uh, is an effective way to make you feel great. Achieve your goals. Inspire yourself through accomplishments. Uh, which increases your dopamine levels. And then number four, start an exercise routine. Uh, the importance of exercise, uh, as we know, can't be overemphasized. The benefits of physical ex exercise are well documented, and I'm just going to add to that list. So not only does exercise help relieve stress or improve our physical health and make us more productive, it also boosts our dopamine levels. Here's something uh, really positive. The exercise doesn't have to be strenuous. Uh, simply taking a stroll or climbing some stairs will achieve a good dopamine jolt. And number five, work on getting a streak going. As with creating a checklist, uh, getting a streak going is a great way to increase dopamine levels. A uh, streak is a visual reminder of how many days in a row you've achieved something. For example, let's say you work out on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, whatever that might be. Mark those days on the calendar, and as you finish the workout, check it off your calendar. Keep a streak going, and you'll keep the dopamine coming as well. People who have broken an alcohol or drug addiction celebrate how long they've been clean and sober. I've heard guys in, uh, in, in AA say those kinds of things. I've been clean and sober for, for three months. Uh, this is a streak that brings them pleasure. The next one is eat foods that are rich in protein. Turkey, beef, chicken, eggs. Any kind of protein uh, will help our bodies produce dopamine. And then number seven Listen to music. Do you ever wonder why your music makes you happy? I mean, you can be in the dump one day and, uh, or one moment, and, and, but once uh, the, that your favorite music comes on, it makes us start feeling pretty good about ourselves. Listening to music has so many positive effects. Uh, it reduces anxiety. It, it lowers our blood pressure. It helps improve our mood and for our study here, increases, increases the level of dopamine, which of course creates feelings of pleasure and a sense of reward. And the next one, number eight, begin to meditate. As with exercise, we've discover, discovered more and more benefits to this thing called meditation. And it can be a highly effective form of dopamine increase and help us weed out the bad mental influences uh, that are causing some of our negative behavior. One of the best ways to meditate uh, is to read and to meditate on Scripture and to pray and ask God to help you become the person He wants you to become and to thank Him for what He's already done to help you. You know, I think it'd be a great thing for all of us to have an attitude of gratitude. The ninth thing uh, in my little list, list here is, uh, while there's some great uh, ways of increasing dopamine, uh, as I've described here, uh, sometimes we're facing a time crunch. We really don't have the time uh, to engage in all the activities I've mentioned. 
fortunately, <laughs> there's some natural supplements on the market that can be of benefit. I'm just going to give you a couple. Curry, uh, turmeric, and ginkgo biloba have been shown to boost the dopamine levels and keep it circulating the brain for a longer time. Isn't that neat? And then last but not least, get enough sleep. You know, when dopamine is released in the brain, it creates feelings of alertness. Now, studies have shown that dopamine is released in large amounts in the morning when it's time to wake up. And then, and then, of course, levels naturally drop off and fall as the day progresses and then evening when we go to sleep. However, not getting an adequate amount of sleep appears to disrupt these natural rhythms. So it's really critical uh, to be able to, to get adequate amount of sleep. Now let's delve into the seven-step practical guide to overcoming drug addiction that was developed by Melinda Smith, uh, Lawrence Robinson, and Gene Siegel of HelpGuide.org. Uh, recovery step number one is decide to make a change. You know, it may seem obvious, but it's important to understand the first step in breaking any bad habit is developing a true desire for and commitment uh, to changing your life. Uh, scientists tell us it takes about two and a half months to really break a well-established bad habit. Uh, change, as you know, is never easy. And you may even be wondering right now if you, can, if you have what it really takes to quit. Breaking habits is difficult tasks, so if you aren't fully committed to it, you're likely to fail. Uh, one of the first things you need to do is uh, or understand your habit. Um, most habitual uh, behaviors have evolved because they've been rewarded in some way. Uh, in order to break a habit, you have to understand why you need that reward in the first place. Uh, once you understand what triggers your habit and the reward you need, uh, you can develop a plan that involves strategies for minimizing habit triggers. Then make a list of the harmful effects of your addiction. You know, writing down a specific list of, of the ways in which your addiction is negatively impacting your life can give you some added ammunition, so to speak, toward changing your behavior. But, you know, just rather than just describing the effect in general terms, John, it's destroying my life, or I'm just not reaching my potential. Write down specific ways that your life has changed uh, since your addiction got established. Then evaluate your addiction. Uh, when a person is addicted to a drug, uh, their whole world revolves around using, recovering from the effects of using, and then getting more drugs. I saw a TV special recently that showed this in the life of a young woman that was really heart-wrenching for me to watch. An addiction is a compulsion or an irresistible urge that requires intervention by caring people to help a person acknowledge and deal with their drug problem. Now think about the financial toll that the drug use has on you. Write down exactly how much money you spend to feed it every day, every week, every month, and every year. <laughs> You'll be totally amazed at how much money you're spending to feed that habit. Uh, recovering from addiction is is a lengthy process, and it requires time and commitment and motivation and especially support. Remember what David did. He visualized the rewards of defeating the giant Goliath. Write down the positive things you will see in your life by not being controlled and tormented by your addiction after you quit. And then keep track of your drug use, too including when and then how much you use. Uh, this will give you a little better sense of the role that addiction is playing in your life. By the way, this is why so many people overdose. They don't keep track of their drug use. They can't remember uh, when they took their last dose, so they end up taking more to stay high, and then they end up overdosing. Now let's summarize how you can prepare for change here in step number one. First of all, remind yourself of the reasons you want to change. Think about the past attempts at quitting. What worked and then what didn't? And then set specific goals such as the date to quit. 
or even limits on your drug use. Remove reminders of your addiction from your home and and your workplace. Uh, Tell friends and family that you're quitting and you're asking for their their support. And the recovery step number two, explore your treatment options. Once you've made the decision to challenge your drug addiction, it's time to explore your treatment choices. You know, as you consider the options, keep the following mind in, in mind. Uh, there's no magic bullet or a single treatment that, that works for everybody. Uh, drug addiction treatment should be specialized or, or customized to your unique problems and situation. Uh, treatment should all, also address more than just uh, drug abuse. Addiction affects every part of your life, your relationship, career, health, So treatment success depends on developing a new way of living and addressing the reasons why you turn to drugs in the very first place. And then see a doctor. Consult with a doctor who specializes in chemical addictions. He or she will be more understanding of your drug dependency, and then they can give you some guidance on treatment options uh, for your particular addiction. And then check into a rehab facility if necessary. Barbiturates, meth, cocaine, benzodiazepines, and alcohol withdrawal can all be life-threatening. From the chart on your screen right now, developed by discoveryplace.info, note that withdrawal ends in about 10 days for most drugs, including opiates, but don't try to go through withdrawal on your own. It's important to detox and recover under the caring hands of professionals of a rehab facility to help you deal with the physical withdrawal effects. Then recovery step number three, reach out for support. Don't try to do this alone. Uh, Whatever treatment approach you, you, you choose, having a solid support system is absolutely essential. The more positive influences you have in your life, the better your chances for recovery. People you can turn to for encouragement and guidance and even a listening ear will add a new dimension to your recovery effort. And then build a social network of sober friends. Uh, If your previous social life revolved around drugs, you may need to make some new connections. It's it's important to have sober friends who will support you during your recovery. And then join a local recovery support group. Evidence shows that addicts who have a strong network of support uh, from those in a support group have much better success in recovery. Twelve-step programs are the most popular type of of self-help peer support groups in the world. One of these programs are, 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 are sometimes more helpful than others, so you need to find one that really appeals to you. Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, the Christian 12-step program, and Celebrate Recovery are all geared towards supporting individuals recovering from various addictions. And of course, make meetings a priority. Spending time with people who understand exactly what you're going through can be very healing. And you can benefit from the shared experiences of the group members and learn what they have done to to break their addiction and stay sober. And find a counselor, one that specializes in drug addiction uh, counseling. Uh, You can get a recommendation for a counselor from your doctor or the rehab facility I just mentioned. Then recovery step number four, learn healthy ways to cope with stress. Visualize success in your mind. Begin to practice breaking the habit by imagining situations in which you engage in the absolute right behavior that you wanted to reach and, 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 uh, and you're trying to achieve. And then plan out your day. In order to break old habits, you might even have to plan out every single hour of the day. Uh, this will help you develop new routines that uh, don't include drugs. And I can't overemphasize the importance of, of being patient, too. Recognize that beyond the physical cravings for the drug, uh, you might have some emotional connections, too. Uh, you might yearn for the way uh, things used to be. Know that it takes time. 
uh, to, to, for a new lifestyle. And, and, and you and will be successful and adjust uh, if you stick to your plan for recovery. And then change your environment. Research suggests that sometimes our environment can induce us to perform certain behaviors. Breaking a habit then is partially a matter of reducing triggering influences until you can develop new ways of dealing with those triggers. And forge relationships with people who support your desired behavior. You don't need to ditch your old friends entirely. But finding some new ones who live the way you want to live uh, can help minimize the triggers. And then create a barrier to your habit. Uh, if you can create obstacles that make the habit more difficult to engage in, it can help you break the routines that have reinforced this habit in the past. And then reward your ex uh, uh, successes. Because habits are created when a behavior is rewarded in some way, you know, a great way to create a new habit is to reward yourself for good behavior. Uh, figure out something that you can get a reward from that doesn't, of course, include drugs or alcohol. And then develop a plan for living without drugs. This plan will involve how to manage temptations and cravings when they occur, how to deal with boredom and discouragement, and learning how to meet responsibilities that you may have been neglecting in the past. And then relieving stress without drugs. Drug abuse often stems from the misguided attempts to manage stress. Uh, many people turn to alcohol or recreational drugs just to unwind and relax after a stressful day. But there are healthier ways to keep your stress level in check. After you become sober, the negative feelings that you used to dampen with drugs or alcohol, they're going to resurface. So you'll need to learn healthy ways to handle these feelings. Let's look at some strategies for relieving stress without drugs. Now, exercise, as you know, relieves stress and, and promotes emotional well-being. Try running in place, a jumping rope, or walking around the block, or any kind of exercise that you find uh, relieves your stress. Then listen to some calming music. Now, close your eyes and picture a peaceful place, such as a sandy beach with all those calming ocean wave sounds. Wow, that sounds good to me. Make yourself a steaming cup of coffee or tea or soak in a hot bath or a shower. All these can help lower your stress level and allow you to relax. Let's look at recovery step number five. Keep your triggers and cravings in check. While getting sober from drugs is an important first step, it's only the beginning of the process. Once sober, the, the brain needs time to recover and rebuild those mental connections that have changed while addicted. During this time, drug cravings can be intense. You can uh, continue to be successful in recovery by making a conscious effort to avoid people, places, and situations that trigger the urge to use. And then make a break from the old drug buddies you still, that are still using drugs. and Avoid bars and clubs. You know, you may say, well, John, I really don't have a problem with alcohol. But, you know, drugs are often readily available at these places. And the temptation to use can be absolutely overpowering. Let's, let's talk about uh, coping with drug cravings. Sometimes cravings just cannot be avoided. And it's necessary to find a way to cope. Uh, one of the ways is to get involved in some distracting activity, asking God for help, reading the Bible, jogging, and biking are good examples of distracting activities. Once you're interested in something else, urges will have less power and less intensity. And then talk it through. Find someone you can help talk you through the drug craving periods that you face. Uh, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a family member. Uh, but talk to them about uh, this craving uh, process when it begins. And then another method is using the urge surfing technique. 
uh, if, if you start to feel like you're going to start using again, try urge surfing. This is a relapse prevention technique. By, by recognizing and accepting urges, you'll be able to ride them out or surf them as it's called. Uh, reach your urge from 1 to 10, then pray and ask God to set you free from this urge and know that he's going to provide an avenue for, of escape for every temptation. Wait 10 minutes. Busy, busy yourself with an activity. Read some Bible verses that give you strength. Clean the junk out of your car even, or anything that occupies your mind. Check your urge level again. If you're still experiencing a high level of urge, repeat the steps above we just talked about. And then recovery step number six, build a meaningful, drug-free life. If you don't have a job right now, get one. Uh, keep, bu keep yourself busy by, by getting a job, even if it's only part-time. Uh, this will also start building up some self-worth and self-esteem as you, as you bring home a paycheck. And then focus on building a new life. Once the worst is past and your body and mind are no longer consumed by withdrawal, spend your time building the life you really want to live. Nourish your relationships with people you love. Work hard at your job. And throw yourself into hobbies and pastimes that are, that are very meaningful to you. Here's something you may not have thought of. Adopt a pet. Yes, pets are a responsibility, but caring for an animal makes you feel needed. I'm a dog person, so I'm going to say this. Dogs especially have a, a help to relieve stress, and because of the unconditional love they give their owner, are always so happy and excited to see you when you come home. You can adopt pets very inexpensively at, at animal shelters or rescue sites online. You may even find uh, pets uh, uh, that people have for some reason not, are, are not able to keep. And, and uh, they're moving out of town or maybe they're ill. So they'll be glad to give you those animals free. Get involved in your community. Replace your addiction with drug-free groups and activities. Uh, volunteer. Become an act active member in your church or join a local club. Set some meaningful goals, uh, having goals to work toward and something to look forward to uh, can be powerful antidotes to drug addiction. And then look after your health. We've already talked about regular exercise, adequate sleep, and, and healthy eating ha habits that will help you keep your energy levels up and your stress level down. When you feel good, drugs are much less of a temptation. The more you can do to stay healthy the easier it'll be to stay sober. And then last but not least, step number seven, don't let relapse keep you down. Relapse is a very common part of the recovery process from drug addiction. While, while it's understandably frustrating and discouraging, it also can be an opportunity to learn from your mistakes and correct your treatment course. What are some of the causes of relapse? Uh, various triggers can put people at risk of relapsing into old patterns of substance abuse. Uh, negative emotional states such as anger and sadness, trauma and stress. Maybe physical discomfort, uh, the withdrawal symptoms, or maybe you're going through some physical pain right now that you're having to deal with. And then those strong temptations or urges, those cravings to use. And then conflict with others, arguments with a spouse, another friend or a partner. And of course, the social pressures to use. John, everyone else is drinking or using drugs. It's very difficult for me not to. The important thing is to remember that relapse doesn't mean failure. Rather than giving up, get back on the recovery program as quickly as you can. Talk to your therapist, go to a meeting, or schedule an appointment to see your doctor. When you're sober again and out of danger, look at what triggered the relapse and what you could have done differently. When you're struggling with a drug addiction, sobriety can seem like an impossible goal. But you know, recovery is never out of reach, no matter how hopeless it may seem to you right now. You can beat your addiction with the perseverance and patience and the help of the Lord 
who came to bring us freedom. Jesus said in Luke 4, 4, 18, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to set the oppressed free. That, my friend, is you. Don't give up. Even if you had tried and failed before, the road to recover, recovery often involves pitfalls and setbacks, but breaking free from drugs is not an impossible goal, my friend. If this class has been a benefit to you, please subscribe by clicking the subscribe button below and be sure to tune into our next session of Escaping the Revolving Door of Prison, session number six, entitled Skill Development for Suitable Employment, part number one. In this session, we'll be discussing how to go about de developing an impressive listing of your skills and strengths. Uh, then covering in detail some of the 25 most common interview questions you will be asked when applying for a job. We will even provide the proper answers to the more difficult questions to answer. And then finally, we'll cover the steps to answering your felony conviction issue in a positive manner. This is John LeMaster saying, I'll be looking for you in our next session.